This podcast is brought to you by absolutely no one. The Bald and the Beautiful Podcast with Dave Vella. Who the hell is Dave Vella? <laughs> Hey, I'm Dave Vella and welcome to the podcast. I've got a real doozy for you today. It's an interesting one. My beautiful guest is a wonderful lady. She's a psychologist, intimacy specialist, and a Yoni mapping therapist. Yonis. Well, Yoni is the Sanskrit word for the entire female genitalia, the reproductive system, the pelvic space, if you like. It also translates to source of life and birthplace of creation. And Mariam works with singles, couples, groups. They share skills, knowledge, and and tools on the ways to develop a deeper emotional and sexual intimacy in relationships, not only with others, but also with yourself. Um, She's a very nurturing lady. She's um, very nurturing, and you feel that in her presence. You feel it in her voice. And over the years of working in the mental health field, she felt pretty uninspired by the disempowering model of uh, practitioner-client. And she also realized that despite years of traditional talk therapy, that the people she was supporting simply were not healing. And often they were just reliving the trauma in her sessions. She also began to recognize her own sexual trauma as a teenager, which was resurfacing in the form of numbness, fear, uh, and anxiety around any form of physical intimacy in partnerships. She said she had to find a way back to herself to reclaim her life. She knew how deeply she needed empowering, but with professional, compassionate, understanding support. So she became this safe space for herself, and now she helps others do the same. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. It was fun, but it will also go to some uncomfortable places for some people. So hang on. Let's go push some boundaries, shall we? Please welcome the beautiful Mariam Noor. Yoni mapping. Yoni mapping. Yoni mapping. <laughs> First of all, tell me Yoni. Yeah. The Yoni isn't just the vagina. No. It's everything. There's, it's everything. Yeah. It's the whole, it's the vulva, yep. the internal, the external, and this, the energetic. It's like in Sanskrit, in mm-hmm. the old yogic yep. language, yep. it means sacred temple. Ah. Sacred place. Sacred place. Because isn't, space. what's the, um, the, the male version of that is lingam or lingam or something yeah lingam so tell me kind of sounds funny hey it does sound very funny lingam (laughs) yoni and lingam lingam. (laughs) why can't we just use penis and vagina (laughs) so So yoni yoni mapping it's not like a map to where all the yonis are is it it's (laughs) it's it's not like a treasure map where's the yonis (laughs) oh my god (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we wished. Yes, everyone would be wanting one, wouldn't Does, they? All, all the all the men wished. All the women would be ringing up. Yes, I'm a pirate. I want a I want a yoni map. <laughs> so oh tell my me, goodness! Tell tell me tell everyone about what is yoni mapping. Okay, cool. So yoni mapping is it is kind of a map. It's it is it is a map in a way because it's getting to understand our way around a place that we don't generally get a lot of time to be deeply present with Mm. like we don't necessarily have a lot of time in our day from day to day to create space that's intentional to so you're talking from the person that owns the yoni from the person that owns the yoni from the partner that like interacts with the yoni like you know like it's very rare and we where we like spend time with the lingam or the yoni the vagina or the penis like looking at it and actually observing it for what it is unless you're on drugs (laughs) (laughs) whoa look (laughs) Look at that. I'm going to try that one what day. <laughs> I think that would be cool. <laughs> well, it's definitely a different way to see things, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> so, it's, so, you're, so you come from, so your, your background, tell me a little bit about your background. You were a psychologist. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I was a psychologist yep. uh, working with like, psych, like abnormal psychology, yep. so like schizophrenia and bipolar and sexual yep. assault. And, and then I, I realized that, it was a little bit limited 
mm-hmm. because there's so much bureaucracy and red tape and who my personality just wasn't suited to being restricted. Yeah. You know, I just felt I was really green and wanted to help everybody and I really felt like I was limited in that in that field. So I left the field and went on my own journey of understanding how I want to live life and it, be, it became clear to me that I really wanted to live life in a really holistic and, and more unique way that was individual to me. So then I went on a journey. I started, um, I was actually in a relationship. I was engaged mm-hmm. and we, you know, we had our own, um, our own issues inside of our sexuality and inside of our emotional intimacy. I just, we didn't feel like we were on the same page, you know, we weren't really sleeping together very often and that was becoming an issue in our relationship and you know i can just remember the conversation the one of the last conversations we had around like our sex and it was like he was like babe we're like 25 we're supposed to be rooting like rabbits and instead we're like 90 year old couple that just don't have sex and i just and i I, you know it was like a penny drop you know it was like oh shit you know like there's some truth to that. And, you know, it was so much of it was all also being driven by his friends' false stories about rooting every woman in the car. Like, even the language, you know, mm. it just speaks to so even much. the word rooting. Yeah, like, yeah. it was terrible. So, so Aussie, isn't it? That, it is. And, it, and it's so, like, um, I think it's, like, really removed from, you know, you can you can have, like, you can make love, you can fuck, you can, mm. you know, like there's different layers of, of the way our sexuality expresses, hey. Mm. And I just wasn't seeing anything other than this really young experience that I'd had of sexuality being this pornographic performance. Mm. And I just felt like so unco in it. <laughs> I just felt like I didn't know what the <laughs> fuck I was doing. And like when I was trying to do the thing that I thought I was supposed to be doing, it just felt so just so disconnective like I just felt so disconnected and like not intimate at all or connected to my partner and I felt kind of gross actually Mm. not gross because I like I felt ashamed I felt ashamed of my sexuality and I felt really you you felt ashamed of you because you liked it or because you didn't like it or because you weren't having it what was all of the above (laughs) (laughs) I felt ashamed because I was like yeah, I was like, you know, I had desire and I didn't know how to, like, enjoy that. Like, mm. I, I think my, my parents were really Christian and Catholic and, you know, being raised in the Middle East and, you know, family as well. Like, my mum, I think, you know, one of the first times that she ever interacted with my sexuality was, well, she introduced me to sexuality as this really sacred thing. Mm. Um, but I never saw it as a say. I never saw anyone around me engage in a, in a way that was respectful or honoring or loving even. Um, so I never really experienced sexuality as something deeply loving, mm. you know, and I just, I, deep down I knew it could be. I just didn't know how to have it be because I had all these unco experiences of trying to perform. We all, we all have pretty unco experiences <laughs> as we're growing up. It just looks totally. like, that, really? Yeah, but like... I also, as an adult, like just didn't okay, have yep. any idea like what I was doing that could be making it, you know, not like I, I didn't understand why I didn't feel good. Mm. It never felt good. It always felt like someone was invading my space. So um, how, how does that lead, or how does that lead into getting involved with the Yoni? Like obviously yeah. being a psychologist and then, okay, being a psychologist, dealing with that sort of stuff. Yeah. having sexual things yourself, whether it be issues or whether yeah. it be questions or, yeah. you know, things happen with you, is that what led to going, okay, I need to sort of yeah. heal myself and yes. heal, is that what happened? Yeah, yeah. it was that, it was that okay. moment where, yeah. he, you know, that penny dropped and yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I actually have I have something to deal with here. Yeah, like, okay. This is an issue for me. Yeah. And I went away, we, we broke up and um, I went away on a journey. I went overseas, like I quit my job and... I did all the things that, you know, left everything. Mm. I did all the things I needed to do to really start afresh. And I found myself in Bali doing a yoga teacher training, having never done yoga in my life. (laughs) It was the most (laughs) bizarre thing I've ever done. But, you know, I just felt this like real calling. Like like I was at at the ocean after my house sold and it was like the last piece that I had to let go of, you know. Mm. 
Um, but I felt so free. I felt so free and so really, truly me. And it was like this moment of bliss, you know, because I felt so true to myself. And there was sadness, obviously, I was grieving, but I just felt so good to have acknowledged that actually there's a whole bunch of stuff in my life that I want to work on and I'm in a place now where I can do that. Mm. And then it just popped up in my head, go to Bali, do yoga teacher training. So I did. I just followed that and I, I absolutely loved it. And while I was doing yoga teacher training, I just had a lot of insight into you know things that were missing for me and things that I hadn't felt that I'd been pushing away and just got more in touch with my feelings and got to slow down and yeah just got really um, activated in my body mm. you know I started to feel energy and to feel more myself and I think I had a lot of like health issues I had irritable bowel syndrome and I had a lot of back issues and they were all psychosomatic. They were all related to the shame that I was carrying. Yeah, wow. Yeah, they were related to the shame that I was carrying. There and must be a lot of people carrying trauma. that sort of stuff around with shame. and Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. I, there's like almost everybody that comes in has a story that they tell me about when they were a child and they were first like found, like somebody witnessed them masturbating or self-pleasuring and their, their parents' reaction wasn't, you know, it wasn't loving, it wasn't accepting. It was like it was dirty. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. They, and they, you know, they remember the time when they lost the connection with their sexuality as an innocent and like, and also something to them personal. Like, you know, like that parent projected that their sexuality isn't theirs and their body isn't theirs to, to do what, as they wish to it, mm. you know. Um, and, it, and it's funny because I find myself giggling with them because it's like so beautiful. Like it's, it's what we all share, you know, like this, this real connection to our sexuality as a really innocent thing and very much ours. It's mm. ours. And, and we, we experience these shocking, these, these jarring moments where adults just have lost connection with that mm. and then project their experience of their shame onto our experience of innocence mm. and then there's something lost in that and we giggle about it because it's you know the little children they're so powerful they just know you know they're just so connected to life and they come out knowing and then they do things that are really like innocent and beautiful like <laughs> you know like have a pillow and yeah. <laughs> and explore you know yeah. one of the best stories i have is like um when when i was like a i was a young and we were, I was at Sunday school. My parents were exploring Jehovah's Witness. And as you can imagine, Jehovah's Witness is really straight. And I remember coming out of my room and um, I was playing with, um, I was playing with, I was playing with my Yoni and it felt so good. And then I came out of my room and just announced to all my friends that they should play with their Yonis because it's great fun. You didn't call it a Yoni back then, though, did you? I told them it was my, in Arabic, it's tutu. So okay. I was like, I'm, I'm playing with my tutu and it's great fun and you should too. I said to them, like, you should massage it because just like your elbow, it needs a massage. <laughs> Isn't it funny that That's like great. 30 years on, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, you're massaging the tutu. The tutu. Yeah. <laughs> massaging the tutu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so I just think children and I think that's that's like what yoni mapping is so much about. It's like reconnecting us to like the essence of what our sexuality is as this like just really innocent and playful loving thing that you know, it's us. Mm. Our sexuality is just an expression of us. It's something that we know we know well. So okay, cuz it's I mean, I'm sure there's many people who are listening to this as well have never heard of yoni mapping yeah are probably like what the hell is is going on there how does, yeah. how does it even work how, they, they're trying to picture it yeah um i can just imagine people picturing different things in their mind yeah so how does someone like someone who comes to you why are they coming to you are they coming to you because of trauma because of repressed feelings because of issues or what, what are you finding that they're coming to you for yeah all those things and what makes them realize that Hey, I need my yoni massaged. How yeah, do they even think of that? Good question. Yeah, yeah, they really, a lot of people come because they feel called. There's like this real, I've just really wanted to talk to someone about this stuff and I've just not found anything safe and I 
didn't even know this existed. Mm. And I, I feel like, yes, this is what I've needed this like a whole rep- time. A, like a repressed sexuality or repressed sort of issues around it that's made them go, I, maybe they're not too sure exactly what it is. They just know it's related to sex and their, 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 that area. Yeah, or even their, fem- ever, even their femininity. Yeah, yeah. You know, like yeah. they just feel like they're there's something for them that they really feel like they know is something that they want to like break down the limits around Mm -hmm. and just get really like more understanding of what's happening for them and they they could it could be because they're not feeling really intimate with their partner a lot of people you know a lot of couples come in you know saying like i i just don't feel desire i just i actually feel really disconnected from my sexuality and i'm not really interested in it Mm. Um, I feel, you know, like I really want something from my partner that, you know, I don't know how to explain and I don't know how to create it with my partner. Um, or I feel really, I feel really, um, scared. Mm. Like I feel really like vulnerable to open and I don't, I want to open and I want to be connected to my femininity and that, that soft part of me and, you know, that wild part of me or, you know, and, and. Yeah, all these reasons, people who've just given birth, you know, when women have just given birth, it's quite a it's quite a time that's sensitive for women inside of their bodies. Their body goes through such a massive journey physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. And it can really leave them feeling like they want to re they have to like re explore what where they're at with their body and their sexuality and their identity as a woman because it's transformed. So mm-hmm. is this Yoni mapping, is this for them to become more acquainted with their own body or is it for, is it for some sort of, is it like a, a healing that you do on them? Like, so is it you, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, is it you teaching them what to do with it or is it you working on it like a massage therapist like hey here we go <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of it's it's kind of something we do together okay it's it's a journey we take together yep. and you can think about it like just a safe space where any questions are welcome and any experience are welcome to be shared any feelings are welcome to be shared and any like things that have been like burning issues or burning thoughts or burning curiosities can come and be aired and shared and in, like it's a really human space to like share about like so our it is like a psychology session as well well it's different to a psychology session because psychology sessions are quite limited in clinical whereas mm. this is more like one human to another human one woman to another woman or one woman to like a couple like a man and a woman like talking about real life yeah you know and explo- exposing life and sexuality for what it really is you know there's bumps and humps and awkwardness and and all of that is welcome so it sounds more confronting than psychology sessions it sounds very confronting look i tell you what when you have permission to really explore something in a safe way in at your own pace it shouldn't be confronting it really is like you're leading the pace Mm. so you're obviously coming with you know a desire to uncover something for yourself you're coming with a desire to do something maybe that you haven't done before and a lot of people that's what makes it so transformative is that they've come to the edge of where they are at inside their growth they see that this this next place this final frontier or this place of growth is really has a lot of untapped untapped potential for their life and their pleasure and their joy and their fulfillment and well-being and intimacy, you know, mm. intimacy is core to our life. Mm. It's so much of what we're about as human beings. We're social creatures and we need to have deeply fulfilling intimacy to really feel a deep sense of well-being and a deep sense of connection to life. It also feels, and I can, you know, I, I, I was married yeah. and and a lot of people, I suppose, would feel similar where you feel like intimacy dwindles in a relationship the longer the relationship goes totally um and that's so normal yeah so normal so is it is it is it women who are wanting to um, i know you you say you have couples come in but obviously it's mainly women is that would that be fair to say or is it um yeah 
No. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Like lately, no. I, like oh. I've had a lot of like couples and men come in who like really need to be witnessed inside of what's going on for them. Like mm. A lot of repressed desire and things that really need to just have a safe space to be held and and also like a an understanding of how to actually direct that in a really healthy way, how to like experience that with their partner in a healthy way and you know, mm. or how to ha- experience that with themselves in a healthy way. Is, is there, are there, are there people that come in who, I mean, obviously people must come in for different reasons. Yeah. Are there people that are coming in just because they're finding they're not, there's no sexuality in their, in their relationship and, and this, it, it's something that they're holding in, whether it may be in the relationship, it may be because, like you said, like, you know, birthing can change stuff. So mm. the sexuality has gone and it's a matter of, maybe it's getting the man in touch with what that whole area is all about and how to be kinder and more loving. I mean, because we're pigs. Men are pigs. That's what we do. Oh, we're, come on. No, we are. We, can, we're, we, we grow up. Men grow up very... The way we grow up and the way we get taught about women and, and with our mates, it's, 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 it's totally different to what, what it needs to be, you know, so... It's a reflection of our culture, isn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, and like we're not really given the opportunity to interact with the vagina and the lingam and sexuality. We don't know. Like we, that's what I'm saying. And I want to say we're pigs. I mean, I mean, I'm because I'm, I'm a man. I can say that about us. But we we don't know enough about it. You know, like mm. as I said to you earlier, what I know about a vagina is that's where I want to be, <laughs> and that's where I came out of. <laughs> you know, so that's what we know about it. Oh, and <laughs> we we don't we're not really in touch with it in a way that we honor it yeah you know yeah and but there is this deep you know when people come in they actually do like they they do feel that way about it mm. it's and it's an opportunity it's like something that's deep inside that we all feel subconsciously we feel we are connected to it as mm that place you know we come out of there every yeah. one of us comes out of a vagina mm. and at some level in or out of the stomach or out of the stomach that's true but we we lived in that yeah area. We lived, or, or, that's what you said because the, you know? the the yoni is also in, incorporating the womb yeah the yeah, womb yeah. the whole like space yes it's not just the vagina everyone it's exactly. all these different things together <laughs> and the and the, to be clear the vagina is like the internal and the vulva includes the external yeah and, and, you know, mapping is really about becoming clearer as well as women and as partners of women around what is, what are the parts? Like, mm. Okay, so there's like labia and there's a clitoris and, and then there's internal labia and mm. well, there's a perineum and, you know, there's all these muscles and, and we go into that, you know, we go into that and we go into what's inside as well, you know, what's... There's a G spot. There's an A spot. There's so many erogenous zones that, you know, we don't get taught these things in school. Mm. Most of what we get taught in school is just don't get an STI. Yes, Whatever don't you get don't, that. don't get anyone <laughs> pregnant. Don't get pregnant. Don't give anyone an STI. Yeah. Don't get an STI. Yeah. And that's not that's not really sexual education. Mm. That's more fear mongering. Mm. And well, it's it's good to know how to stay safe. But you know, we also, I think, really need to have some form of healthy and really permission granting and safe space to explore what sexuality is in a wider context Mm. to our life to our intimacy to each other in our connection to each other and our connection to life and mothering and birthing and dying even you know like like giving birth is a form of dying to the younger self and the, the, the self that was only responsible for the self and then birthing to take care of another life. Mm. You know, your body becomes a portal for another life. And it's, it's you know, phenomenal what that space is. And I think that's what Yoni Mapping gives us the opportunity to do is connect with this space for all of its, mm. all of its, um, all of its things, all of the ways that it's special, all the ways that it's also just a natural, normal thing, mm. like your elbow. You know, like women come in and, <laughs> yeah, they come in and they're mm. like, whoa, that's the safest I've ever felt Yeah, wow. with anybody with my clothes mm. off and my legs open. Like, mm. that's phenomenal. Like, every, so many women. It must be. Say like, that. I, I, I can't even fathom. Yeah. Like, how a woman 
how hard it must be for a woman to come into a space like that yeah. where they don't know the person and you, yeah you've got to literally bear all yeah. and be comfortable with it totally. and not tense up and be relaxed and just have a conversation with you oh yeah by the way that's that and we're talking about that and um and I, you know what i think makes it comfortable dave i think what makes it comfortable is that it's not comfortable in the beginning and that probably the hardest thing that I've witnessed is getting to the session, mm. is coming to the place of, it's the work before you actually decide that you want to go to the mm. session. It's where you're, you, the penny drops and you're like, right, I'm at this part of my life where I know that this is an issue for me. Like there's something here of a growth point for me and I'm scared and I now, now need to have the courage to push past my comfort zone and this boundary that I've had up for so long. And that's what sexuality usually is. Mm. It's like this really repressed, like, you know, walled up thing. And we, you know, the courageous, like they want to, because they, they just, they're just so uncomfortable in, 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 inside of that, behind that wall, like they finally have the courage to, to break down the wall and step inside and outside of their comfort zone, mm. inside of the growth zone and outside of their comfort zone. And then to take, and that's when they can take the next step to, to book the session. And I think that's the hardest part. Mm. I think after that, you know, people come in and they can feel me, you yeah. know, they can feel, I think a person who does this work is re usually a really special kind of person that mm. can hold a really deep, vulnerable space. And I know for myself, what drives me to do this is because I didn't have anyone mm. that I felt safe with, mm. you know, I just, I felt so vulnerable and tender in that space. And I just, I so desperately needed somebody to just make it okay that all of this stuff, even the tenseness and, mm. and the anxiety and you know, I, I felt incredibly, incredibly alone in it. And that's what drives me that I, I know that people need this and, and I want to be that safe space that people can, that I needed. Mm -hmm. People can relax into and just be themselves in. And so, I yeah, women come in and, and they feel really, at first, you know, there's sometimes the anxiety of, you know, the shame or the fear of how it's going to go or, you know, the uncertainty. And um, then there's just some talking and a lot of talking happens, you know, a lot of talking about what's happening for them and then they start to relax and ease into it and they feel more comfortable and they feel like they're just sitting down with a, like a sister, mm. you know. And, just and what, sort of, what sort of ages are coming? Are you seeing all ages or is it mainly an older, you know? What? All ages. All ages. Yeah, like from, I think my youngest clients are usually about 21. Wow. Yeah, 20, 21. And, and then, you know, sometimes maidens can come in like women who are you know further along in their journey like mums aunties bring in their younger ones and we have a chat and stuff like that i don't usually do mapping with anyone under the age of 18 mm. and that's it's not usual it's like i don't do yummy mapping with anyone under 18 but yeah usually 21 is around the age that people start to get i think curious about mm. how they're interacting in their sexuality in a really like yeah, really, um, really ready to look at things. And 21, up until like I've had 60 year old women come in and wow. yeah, they're on another journey, you know, they're going mm. towards their time of, you know, no more bleeding, no mm. more shedding and really coming into themselves. And t it's really a time to nurture the self and bring the energy back inward. You know, if you think of women, when they birth and or they're in that phase of really creating, whether they're, cr they're, well, they're also children, go, all those older women too. and forgive me for being a man on this, but yeah. I'm assuming, you know, as, as we all get older, we feel like we're losing touch with our youth. We're using, mm. we're losing touch with our beauty. Mm. We're losing touch with our, our um, relevance in the world. We're losing touch with, you know, like we know that we're getting one foot closer to the grave, you know, like sure. it's, there's so many things that go through your head as you get older. Um, which I'm assuming those or may not may not happen, but I would say it could be a very big thing for women as they start getting in their sixties. All this sort of stuff happening, so they're going through a whole bunch of different sort of mental processes, aren't they? Yeah, there's big transformations that mm. happen. I really want to speak to something that you mentioned, like losing uh, relevance in the world, is really interesting because it was it was what I was actually going to speak to you next is like that that phase of no longer be being 
generative in mm. the sense of like creating businesses or creating children or creating home and yep. nurturing other people, looking after businesses and other people in businesses or, you know, there's a yep. creative phase and yeah. that's really the spring of a woman's life mm. and a man's life. Mm. And then there's the next phase, which is really like beginning to actually nurture, to come back to self yep. and nurture and bring the energy inward and the nurturance inwards. You know, you think of the children leaving the nest or, you know, the business being handed over to the next mm. generation. And then it's really about actually sitting back and reflecting because we are getting closer to, well, I mean, every day we're getting closer to death. That's all we, mm. get, we have for sure. Yeah, for death. sure. But death like, and taxes. Death, death and taxes. And taxes. Um, unless you're really smart and evade them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, that's all we really know for sure. And, and I think there's a there's something to be said about like getting ready for death in a really lovely way, like really looking back on life and being able to admire mm. and, and reflect on the life that we've had, the things that we've done or not done. And for women, you know, it's a really, really fertile time because it's a time when she no longer has to be the things that society needs her to be, you know, that there's a real pull sometimes for women to generate, you know, to generate children, to generate mm. in the world. Same for men, you know. And then to the, support, there's a lot of... To support, yeah. to nurture, and all of that sort of falls away and then she's just left with this emptiness. And, mm. and that emptiness is actually fertile soil for what does she want to now, you know, like what's the next phase of what she wants to develop for herself and grow for herself and you know that could look like volunteering for other people and doing other things that she feels value in it could be you know starting to travel the world for herself you know it could be spending time with inside her marriage or her partnership in a different way it could be exploring different forms of relate, relating and connecting sexually it could be for a lot of women it's, it's a sexual revolution like they T totally have a new lease on their sexual life and their whole lease on, on life and I just think there's so many different ways that a person can narrate their life mm. and make something of it and a lot of women come in really wanting to get in touch with their maiden again at that age because there's something that was incomplete for her in that you know she's mm -hmm. looked back on her life and seen that she hasn't truly been loved in the way that she wants to be you know she's had a marriage for 30, 40, 50 years and is just something that she hasn't touched yet and she mm. doesn't want to leave without having touched that thing, yep. you know, that deep intimacy and that deep feeling of being nurtured inside of her. Isn't that beautiful? It's awesome, yeah, to talk about us. <laughs> yeah, just like doesn't want to leave without having touched that. Yep. And I think it's just, it can happen in any stage of life, but I think it's really important to like ask the question, like how... How deeply have I touched the intimacy that I really yearn for in my life? It's it sounds quite amazing how much how much mental trauma for for one of a better word of purpose using that right, but mental trauma and and stuff that we hold comes from our sexuality and comes from, so for women obviously from from that from men from you know, just being, you know, told that we shouldn't be doing that and masturbation's dirty and therefore, and then when sex happens, it's like, okay, well, we don't, we don't, we really don't get shown how to do anything. No one really yeah. tells us, you know, sexual education, as you said, it's more about don't get that disease, wear a condom, that's where babies come from, that's how it works. It's no, okay, well, this is actually the, intimacy sensor the love sensor this is where you can make you know make beautiful your life it's not just about putting your dick in there and doing this and you yeah, know exactly. and we don't get taught that as men we we have to learn that later on and i think sometimes we learn it too late or if at all yeah if at all you know, like if at a all. lot of our parents have like gone been and gone and never really got oh your parents don't tell you shit yeah but they've also never really experienced they didn't know it. anything and we didn't see anything and like i'm going through that now i've got an eight-year-old boy and and what's that like but how do you guys have chats about sexuality and yeah we've we've um we've brought it up because i know that you know the world's moving a lot faster than when i was a kid like when i was a kid like we saw like the first time you saw a woman 
was, you know, you might have saw your mum, but I'm talking, you know, or your sister or whatever, but I'm talking about the first time you actually felt sexual was, you know, you might have found a Playboy under your dad's bed or something like that and you saw some boobs and you saw, you're like, oh, wow. And it slowly, <laughs> it slowly progressed as you got older, you know. Right. So, you know, you saw that and then next time you might have seen something and there was a little bit more happening and then you might have seen some penetration somewhere and mm. then you, you might have seen other things where it was a little bit more. Then you got to see videos and then you saw there was ejaculation and there was this and there was moaning and, and you, whoa, okay, whoa, this is all going on. And, and So do you think we put the pieces together of all our little experiences? Yeah, yeah, kind of I think we did. We had, to, we had to piece it together ourselves. Mm. You know, you never got told, you never got... It was sort of like, okay, that's sort of how it works. And then you sort of got a girlfriend and then mm. she sort of had to say, not there, you idiot. You've put, <laughs> you've put them in the wrong spot. Oh, sorry. And it's all <laughs> embarrassing. You know, everything was just embarrassing. Yeah. And I think what's happening now with kids is it's happening so much faster. They're seeing stuff quicker. Yeah. Like they're seeing, they're seeing porn a lot quicker. Like yeah, I've, sure. like I've, I know from ex relationships, kids, 10 year old kids are seeing porn, Absolutely. you know, like, and they're not just seeing normal porn, they're seeing pretty full on porn of, you know, group activities where, wow, you know, yeah. where not everyone's happy about what's going on. Like, it's pretty full on. So, and I know firsthand, I, I, I know kids that have seen that stuff, right, yeah, where it's totally quite right. full on. So, imagine like, how, you know, old? how 10. old? 10. So, ten. they're 10. They're yeah. 10, they're seeing group porn where the wow. woman's not really involved in loving it that much, you wow. know? Um, they're not seeing love, they're not seeing intimacy, they're not seeing connection, they're not seeing honouring of of the woman's body like it's, you know, a beautiful thing. They're seeing they're seeing um, exploitation of the of the woman's body, you know? Yeah. And that becomes okay, well that's how it is. And then you talk to your mates about it and yeah. it's um, it becomes so it doesn't become embarrassing. It sort of becomes a bit of a joke, you yeah. know, and that's how men, that's how boys deal with it as they're growing up. Yeah. Well, that's how I dealt with it. And I'm, I know a lot of mates, you know, I can't speak for everyone, but. Yeah. Um, it's definitely their script. Of yeah, it's a script for men. Coming, so yeah. I, I, I'm fully aware. And if, if there's anyone out there that doesn't understand, your kids will be seeing porn by the time they're 10. Yeah, you know, absolutely. that's with the internet, with the kids having phones. If your kid doesn't have a phone, y your kid's friend has a phone. And the, the, yeah. the thing is, and what we fail the to... curious creatures. Oh, man, they, the they want to see creatures. stuff, you know. And what you fail to realise too is if you've got an eight-year-old, they might have an eight-year-old friend, but that eight-year-old friend's got a 10-year-old brother. Totally. You know, and then they might have another one that's 12. Yep. And that 12-year-old's got a friend who's 14. You know, so suddenly there's that connection happens really quick. And at 14, at, at 11, at te they're having sex. Yeah. Um, but the 10 year olds, they're seeing porn. So I've had to, you know, bring it up with my boy yeah. um, and he's only eight. So just on sex education and stuff like, we had a song in the car. We had a song in the car the other day. I can't remember what it was. It was little, little Naz, Little Naz. I think the song's Rodeo. I can't remember. There's, there's a song, he's loving this song, but. How's it go, Dave? <laughs> oh, no, I can't, remember. I can't remember it. But he, he loves it, he loves the song. And in the song they mentioned, um, we can, they say something like, we can go and have some sex. Wow, right? okay. And that's cool. I don't mind him listening to it because yeah. I explain it to him. He knows what sex is. I've explained to him what How sex is. How did you explain it to him? What did he say? Um, <laughs> he, um, I just thought it was time to chat about sex education because he asked, right, he asked one time. He asked one time um, how babies were made. Right? That question. Yeah, yeah that, that, that question. And I just <laughs> went, mm, okay. And I said to him, how do you... Because that's right, he was always saying that his mum made him, right? And I said, yeah. I said, but I made you as well. He goes, what? He goes, but I was in mummy's tummy. I said, yeah, but how do you think you got in mum's tummy? I said, I put you there. Right? <laughs> that's not accurate. Dave. It is accurate. <laughs> Stop it. And uh, he goes, I go, this is the funny thing. Listen to this. He goes, he goes, how did you put me there? And I went, how do you think I put you there? I'm, I'm, I'm stalling you. I'm like, how do you think I put you there? And he goes, um... In her mouth, and I, <laughs> I just laughed. Oh, I'm laugh. laughing at myself. I'm going, yeah. Well, that was sort of part of it, but it wasn't the real bit. And um, I sort of just, I, I can't even remember how, but I basically got off. You know, I didn't explain it to him enough, and I had to sort of pause and think for a few weeks. 
And then a few I, weeks. <laughs> yeah, I was just like sitting back just going, how do I explain to this kid? What totally. do I do? You know, because you want to say it the right way. You know, it's really important. You've got a, I've got a young boy there who I've got to, I've always said I'm going to be honest with him and, and how we talk about stuff. So if he asks a question, I'll answer it. Yeah. And I said to him, mate, I will answer that question for you. I said, let me, you know, just... And I, I love that you like recognize the importance of answering that question for him because they really rely on us for, for information. Oh, totally. Look, I remember I, I used to get fobbed off by my mum and dad all the time. Ah, oh, look, don't worry about it. Look, you're too young. You don't. You won't understand. Yeah, you know, that, that was a big thing. And That's I'm, awful. Yeah, and I'm 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 not wanting to, I'm not wanting to, sorry, just adjust that mic. I'm not wanting to um, <laughs> do that to my boy. If he asks me a question, I want to answer it. So I ended up looking at different videos on on. You porn. I mean, YouTube. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no it, was, it was educational videos on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> and, um, Sorry. <laughs> that was priceless. <laughs> educational videos on YouTube and chatted and, and found these, found some really good ones. Found some one that were a bit blur, but found about, a, I think, a seven or eight minute video for kids on reproduction and how sex worked. Mm. And so I sat there and watched with him. And then at the end of it, I said, mate, do you understand that? He goes, yeah. I said, you got any questions? He goes, no. I said, so you understand that's that's how it works. I said, when you know, it's the man putting the penis into the vagina, when they love each other, and that's how a baby is made. There's there's liquid that comes out of the man's penis, that, da, da, da. And, I, and he, he goes, yeah, that's cool. I said, okay, cool. And we left it at that. But Sweet. every now and then I, I bring stuff up with him again and, and redo it. Yeah, so as I said, nice. we were listening to a song about little Naz and it brought up sex and he had his little mate in the back of the car with him and they're singing and I'm watching I'm watching in the rear vision mirror. <laughs> You're waiting for it. I'm watching but I knew it was coming up and I looked and I saw them both look at each other and then sort of giggle when they heard the word sex. And I thought, okay, I've got to have another chat to him about this. <laughs> so that afternoon once I once I picked him up from school, I had a chat and I said, you know, we had a chat about sex. I said, mate, you realise you know what sex is, don't you? He goes, Yeah, I remember. I said, So you remember the video I showed you and we just had another chat about it and I think it's really important just to bring it up and don't make it a big deal. You know, say this is what it is, this is what sex is. And, mm. um, you know, a lot of people talk about it and a lot of people will, it'll be up in songs and they'll mention, he listens to songs with the F word in it. I say, mm. you understand that what that word is. And mm. and I think you've just got to, well, for me, I like to be totally honest and open and transparent with him and, and just let him know what it is. Don't treat him like a like a dummy. Don't treat mm. him like he shouldn't know what it's about. Yeah, totally. If he asks the question, he should know. Yeah. Um, he hasn't asked me any questions about masturbating or anything like that yet. So mm. I know that will come up. Yeah. <laughs> he has mentioned one thing like, um, he has mentioned something because I think he, he had an erection one time mm-hmm. and he was talking about it and said, look, Dad, it's just sticking out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, yeah, it is, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what did he think of that? He goes, why does it do that, Dad? And I said, that's when blood rushes into your penis. And I said, blood rushes into your penis and it makes it go hard. Yeah. He goes, ah. Oh. He goes, okay. And so that, he was satisfied with that. Isn't, and, it, uh, isn't it so interesting, our bodies? Like, mm. I just think they're just so extraordinary. It's, like, and, and that, you know, and that a child that, can even just accept that. Yeah, he just accepted it. He's like, okay, body. cool. And he's, he's pretty cool with it. So, um, but I know there's going to be, like, obviously all that stuff's coming up and masturbation's going to be coming up soon and yeah, I'll probably, totally. you know, you'll probably catch them one day, you know, doing it and you've got to, I think it's really important that you don't shame it. You don't, Absolutely. you don't, you don't make him feel bad for it. Absolutely. You know, you give him his space and um, if you catch him doing it in the wrong spot, I, I think it's really important that you just say, hey, you know, maybe there's a better spot to do it. Yeah, just for their you know? safety. Just you know? for your safety, you know. Um, maybe there's a better spot to do it, you know, because we've gone through all that safety and stranger danger mm. and, you know, that no one's allowed to touch your privates and all yeah. this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I've always called them by the proper name. I always called it a penis, not a not a PP. Yeah. Um, and he knows the word vagina. It's not a tutu. <laughs> yeah, my mum and <laughs> dad were really funny with this. Yeah, them. but it's so were ours, you know. Like, that's just yeah. the era that we grew up in where, you know, you never called anything by its right name and you got embarrassed, you know. And I'm, totally. I'm really cognizant of saying the right words and not, being embarrassed about anything that he has to ask. Yeah. Um, and treating I, it just like it's any it's other body part. It's a normal question, part. yeah. Yeah, like it's a, it's a, just like any other body part. And, and acknowledging the pleasure that comes from it, you know, mm. like babies in the feet, like fetuses in the womb, they mechanically um, bring themselves to, master, to, to orgasm 
Yeah. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. They like bring little buggers? Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's like just a natural, a really biological, natural thing, you know. And I think our associations with our sexuality and our society is, is really what drives a lot of our shame. And it's not ours, mm. you know. It doesn't belong to what we, the relationship we've always had with our sexuality from our formative years you know children have a relationship with their sexuality that's really natural it's just their body they're experiencing like an erection in their body or they're experiencing a a rush of of energy Mm. and excitement in their body and and that's really you know it can be even about like something like going to the playground might give them a rush of excitement and pleasure Mm. you know and it's not it's actually not non-differential it's not any different than being excited by a woman when they're older Mm. you know and i think that's what happens when you're really free in your ability to feel your feelings and you're not ashamed or blocking your feelings you can actually feel those that excitement as pleasure and bliss and and that's how i experience it these days you know i can appreciate when for example i can hear a yes in my body to something i really am excited about doing you know whether that's taking a business offer you know, or meeting a man that actually really lights up my heart and mm. I can feel the, the my heart open to him and then my sexuality follow it, you know. And I think that's what society is really missing. You know, the point that we're missing in our culture is that we've gone so far into objectifying ourselves and each other and we have these really objectified experiences of sexuality and it being, being this really, like, almost violent act of penetration and, mm. and you know, and also performance you know poor men have to have this like massive performance to to be you know called masculine and women have to be this you know this open and completely receptive being and be thrashed and smashed about to you know to say that they're doing the thing and i think that's what we're missing in our society is really becoming more aware and sovereign inside of what our sexuality actually is it's just a natural expression of when our our hearts are happy, we're nourished inside of our intimacy and there's this natural desire to share intimately with another being mm. that we really care for and it doesn't have to be, you know, inside of a monogamous relationship or, and it doesn't have to be, you know, what we traditionally view as, as where we share sexuality. It can be, you know, in a really safe loving friendship you know it can be in a really you know where two adults are consenting and they really want to share intimacy can you know children can actually share the intimacy by actually understanding that this is my body and this is your body and it's really natural for two babies for example to just be touching themselves Mm. in each other's presence you know it's not it's it's all of the shame. Yeah, but and people shame that too don't they they they, shame it and they're terrified i've heard of stories of that where the two-year-olds were like you know, not playing with each other, but one little boy playing with him, the girl playing with themselves, and they're you know just there in the same room. But then they get shamed and smacked and exactly. told that's that's wrong. And children don't have that association, and they need to be taught what's safe and mm. what's appropriate for them, and how to make decisions about what's appropriate for them at the at the right age. But they they are very very. It's very natural to them to explore each other at that age. Mm. It's very important that they explore each other at that age in a safe way, you know, because they are really curious about. Well, I have, I have vagina. What do you have? Mm. You know. Yeah. Why? Why is why? why? You, yeah. Why yeah. do you have it? And how does that feel to have yeah. that? Like, it's just a natural curiosity because they're trying to form their understanding of the world, mm. you know, and that's part of their world. They're constantly feeling rushes of sexual energy, like your son would be feeling rushes mm. of sexual energy. And to him, it's it's just this really cool, fun thing that mm. he feels sometimes. And kids are going to want to c- recreate that really cool, fun thing. So they're probably kids self-pleasure all the time. Mm. And they do it in their own way, unless they've, you know, they've really been shamed. And it's a, a good sign that a child has been, you know, shamed from their sexuality is when they stop. Or if they've been, uh, like, if they've been assaulted, yeah. Or inappropriately Inappropriately dealt with, with, yeah. Yeah. Then that's going to mess all sorts of shit up. Yeah. And it's really important to, like, that that can be one of the the checkpoints for a parent to, like, just check in. Be like, hey, buddy, like, are you, like, do you have fun with your your penis? Like, Mm. you know, it's a cool thing. It gives you pleasure, doesn't it? Like, Mm. do you have fun with it? Like, 
this is this is some of the things you can do to have fun with it like just having that conversation is well that's that's a big conversation though that's i don't know how many i don't know how many men could have that conversation with their boy that must be that would be a pretty like i i feel like i'm pretty open with my boy about stuff i don't know if i could I don't know if I could quite go, hey, here's all the sort of different ways you can have fun with your penis. Look, there's a wristwatch. There's... <laughs> yeah, <Dave. laughs> you are so beautiful. Uh, well, actually, here's one. Here's the parents. Big Mac. <laughs> oh, God. The vacuum. Yeah, the vacuum. <laughs> I've heard so many stories about vacuums. <laughs> I heard it's really, really interesting. Oh, you mean when the vacuum goes over and it's like, yeah. oh, and the, yes. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really Ooh. intense. <laughs> Jeez, that would hurt. Yeah, I just I, put it on I low. I can't imagine. All I can say is put it on low. Yeah, no, don't, don't no use, high intensity don't use stuff. The high. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I think that would be hard for a, a man. Yeah, well, here's something for the parents. Um, I've got a great colleague, her name's Lily Isabella, and she does amazing. You got a great what, sorry? Colleague. Oh, yeah. She does. She supports parents having these conversations with their children. Oh wow! And she has workshops for parents and children and of all ages. And she's worth checking out if you okay. just Google um, Lily Isabel. Uh, or it might be Lily. Well, I'll, I'll put I'll put um, I'll we'll, put a we'll link to these. her in the notes. Yeah, let's put yeah. these up yeah, for well. them. And yeah, like there's so many amazing educators who mm. like really share like when it comes to what age to share things, how to share things, there's so much information out there. Mm. And I think the, the most important thing is really becoming comfortable within ourselves, mm. you know, to really look at how we're relating to our body and sexuality. And when we're comfortable, it's just going to be a natural and comfortable thing for them. Mm. You know, children don't do what we say. They really look at what we, mm. how we interact with the world and how we interact with our sexuality. And they're going to, they're gonna, just going to model that. You know, so if you're really like worried about it, just I still have this. Do that. Yeah, I like. I think kids are really impressionable, and they they um, as you said, they they see what we do, and that's how they model their own behaviour. Yeah. And I have this one distinct memory from being a kid, where I think I walk. Oh, I know I did. I walked in on my mum and dad, <laughs> and. <laughs> And they. What was that like for you? I think it was well. All How I remember. Oh, I reckon I was. I reckon I was five or six. So quite young. Yeah, but my mum was only young, so they were in their in their rooting phase. You know, as you said before. How old were um, they? Oh, well, my mum had me at seventeen, so she was right. like twenty-two or something. And. Um, I hope we always are in our rooting phase. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I just remember basically being pushed out the door. Like, you know, I caught, like, well, I caught them. I just walked in. I'm, I, I, mm. I, it must have been the middle of, I don't know if it was the middle of the day, the night. It, it, my memory tells me it was the middle of the day, but who knows. I just remember, because the room was bright, and I walked in. Yeah. They were doing it. They looked surprised, got up, said, okay, get out, and just ushered me out the door, and that was it. And then nothing was explained. Nothing was done, and I'm just sitting there going, what the? What do you think happened? Um, what do you think they were well, doing? now I know. At the time, <laughs> <laughs> now I know. At the time, I didn't know shit. I was. Um, Did you think they were fighting or I, wrestling? I, I really, I, I can't, I can't remember. Yeah. I, I don't know what I remember. I just remember the incident. Hey, you know BJJ. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for yeah. those. It, this isn't those. a sexual term for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to just con- confirm that. BJJ isn't blowjob junkie, okay? It stands for Brazilian <laughs> Jiu Jitsu. So yes, I know BJJ. Doesn't that so remind you of like intercourse? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. I'm so glad you brought that up because I tell people this. Hold on, my microphone is caught. Because <laughs> sorry, um, I um, tell people it's very similar to. And I don't mean this in a bad way, because then it's going to sound weird. Because you know you've got men and men together, and you've got men and women together, and you know you've got to feel very comfortable in that space for a start. It's a very intimate place to be. You know mm-hmm. that close proximity is is um, really only matched by having sex with someone. Yeah. And pelvises press up against each other, pelvises and butts press up against each other, heads and butts press up against each other. There's all sorts of yeah. positions you're in. Yeah. You know, you could do a tantric BJJ <laughs> sort of thing. Um, so it is very similar because you've got to be you've got to be in touch with the other person's body movements. Mm. You know, it's all about 
using your body to feel their body. You're not just using your hands or your legs. It's like you've got your hip in a certain way that you can feel where they're moving and you're responding to that. So it's very, very similar. And yeah. hopefully that doesn't gross anyone out and make anyone go, oh, what are you doing? Why should it? You know, yeah, no, it like... shouldn't because there are similarities. You know, yeah. it's... it's um, it's body language, you know, yeah. and it's movement and it's proximity and it's, yeah. It's, what made you think of that? Just the first time I saw it, the first thing I saw was just the beautiful, like, dance of, mm. like, exactly that. Like, just how human it is and how in close proximity you are. And also, like, you know how, like, in when we're making love, it can be really like um, it can turn really like wild, mm. and then there's all. And then sudden... you choke them out. And, is that what you're about? <laughs> and then, Put them and in then an armbar. Out, and then, <laughs> and oh, then sorry. Tapping out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I can. Yep, I've got yep. experiences yep. like that. Um, I've got experiences where I definitely wanted to tap out. <laughs> <laughs> but like, no, like I just I felt this like real sense of like. It just like is like this dance and flow where there's like moments where you're like really soft and like that you're feeling each other and you're trying to like mm. get an impression of that person and where the weight is in your relationship mm. and where you yeah, know interesting. And yeah, like, yeah and it's the same like I feel like in intimacy like when we're when we're like getting becoming intimate with someone and sharing like in the sexual space like as adults we we really do feel out the relationship and mm. like where we can share ourselves and where we can't and you know and there's just so much of that like dance of you know how how much can I lean into you and how much mm. can you lean into me and there's this like real sussing out of of the bodies and and I feel like in intimacy and sexuality it's so like that like you know you, you're moving through the different like waves of you know like mm. emotion yeah. and and desire and the stuff that is your relationship, your connection. And just on that with uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, because I, I coach kids in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right. and it's really beautiful to see boys and girls in that sort of moments where they're, they're, they're in those intimate spaces, but they don't, they're not getting funny about it. You know, yeah. like I've coached girls from them being four all the way through to... You know, like I've coached them for six, seven years, yeah. and to see them grow as as young ladies yes. and go from say four to you know ten, eleven, and yeah. I've coached girls that are eight and they and now sixteen, and yeah. and to see them not be intimidated by being in an intimate space with a man, you know, because there's a lot of stuff in jujitsu where you've got your legs, you're in a very compromising position. It's called the guard and it's where one person's on their back with their legs spread basically and legs wrapped around someone, which yeah. is very much a sexual position. Yeah. Um, and so for, for girls and women, it's... Or, or it's just a position or it's just that a, we associate. Yeah, we're just a position you associate yeah, with. So, it's really human. Yeah, so it's really, I think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for kids, not yeah. only just for the self-defense, but for, the, for them to gain confidence in their body and not be not feel funny about having a guy in their space or not feel funny about being that close to a girl. Yep. It's really, really important. Absolutely. And I can tell you firsthand, it's it's beautiful to see and it's beautiful to see them just take it in their stride and, and accept it like this is what it is because that's how it should be. Yeah. You know? And if I feel like it is so much about how they actually hold their ground mm. and their boundary mm. inside of their own body and how they tackle conflict like mm. healthy conflict yeah. it's like a way that the body can move through the challenges of relating with another person mm. you know a person comes in and overwhelms you with their weight in the same way that a person might overwhelm you with for example your you know their emotions mm. and then yeah, how you yeah. yeah like how you deal with it and how you meet that with your own boundary and your your willingness to move your weight so that you're actually you know bringing in your own assertion and your own like mm. control of your body and, and being able to master your own energy and then and inform somebody else of where you stand and how they can actually relate to you. Like you're also, you hold power in your body as well. So, it, you know, and I feel like that's really important for little girls and boys to really be able to feel healthy enough and stable and secure enough in themselves that they can actually move their energy and be, you know, resilient and, and be able to execute their boundary mm. in their body 
I think it's a really healthy way to explore boundaries and and conflict. Is this why you told me just before we came on the conversation that you want to start Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Absolutely. I think it's just such a healthy way to resolve a lot of body mm. trauma. I think it's a beautiful way to come out of the, fe- the freeze state for a lot of people. When people have been traumatized by an experience, especially sexual tr- experience, mm. a lot of the bodies involved in that, I mean, I- at any level, emotional, mental um, trauma, the body is involved. Trauma happens at the body level 100%. I'm not talking about trauma that's like, you know, a massive car accident or, you know, what we expect it to be. Trauma can be, you know, a a balloon popping when we're three Mm. and that's shocking our body but it happened at a body level and the memory of that you know in our body is really there Mm. and when we hear a loud noise we can you know have this jolt and the body can remember you know trauma is not what we think it is it's very it can be like really subtle experiences of having been rejected as a child in the playground and just that memory lives on and then we we interact with people from that memory, you know, of being rejected and feeling rejected in life. So I think everything, it's like sexuality and that's why it can be really confronting, you know, to be vulnerable and sexual, you know, with other people because we have things in our body that feel really like alive. They come alive when we're vulnerable and open sexually and they, that, that experience is right there on the surface. Because we're open mm. and we're vulnerable. And so we get seen in the stuff. And I think having experiences like Yoni Mapping where you're safe and you're held and you're actually being guided in how to hold the body to release the memory and guided to feel the feelings without the feelings overwhelming us and to feel the feelings in the body as a, as a, as a physical sensation. You know, people, mm. people, I don't think we're, we're aware of this, but like, emotions come up as physical sensations and we, we don't always feel aware of it because we numb out mm. and and that can be a lot of why people feel disconnected from their sexuality or really overwhelmed by it or dis, or just really um too vulnerable to go there and and i think experiences like yoni mapping therapy or having a massage with somebody who's really able to hold the body in a really loving way in the, as as a body not as an object, as a sexual object. And that's what yoni mapping is. It's really holding the body as a body. Mm. You know, that it's this, it's really this, it's a beautiful and very, very sacred actual map of our psyche, mm. you know, and, and it, it deserves to be held with loving kindness and, and a lot of care and a lot of listening and presence. Is there a lot of emotional outpouring during one of these sessions with, with many women? Like, do they just... You know, it looks so different. Mm. Every woman's journey is so mm. different. Some of them are really emotional. Some of them, and you know, we can go from... Some of them freak out, like we get to a point and you're just like, oh, and it's just I've never something... had that happen. No, really? Okay. Yeah, I never really had anyone freak out or feel um, overwhelmed by their stuff, you know? Mm. Like, it's, you know, there's there's been like, you can have one session and have all the human emotions in one session, grief, mm. joy, and they roll in, you know, one after the other sometimes. There's laughter, you know, our body can have lots of releases that have just come out in giggles and laughter. Mm. Um, there's also laughter because we're, we're also like really just, you know, just having a chat, mm. like, and it's funny things come up sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, like some of the things that like couples also like come with, you know, they just... You know, it's really we're, we're really endearing creatures, and we do some funny things to deal with our sexuality, you know. And so it can really, like Dave, it can look like a walk in the park sometimes. Mm. It can just be like a really relaxing, nourishing massage where a woman just feels so deeply held and nourished, and finally, ah, that softness that she's wanted to be like really presenced with and touched by, she feels that. And a lot of the time, women also have things with sisters, like they feel like they can't trust women because they've had mm. experiences where the woman's like betrayed them or just, you know. Do women ever feel weird because it's like, I mean, as much as it's not a sexual thing, there's obviously... It's engaging our It's engaging though. our sexuality, yeah. It's, so, en- it's engaging our sexuality, but it's not a sexual encounter. Yeah. And so you've got a woman performing this this yoni mapping therapy on another woman, do they ever sort of then, is it, is it a, like, do, do you ever ask them, do they feel funny because it's a woman touching them? Do they feel like it's 
hey, that's that's weird. Because I know if you had a man doing, hey, if there was a lingam therapy. Yeah, right? there is. <laughs> is there really? <laughs> yes. Get the hell out of here. Yeah. There is not. There is too. <laughs> Get I, out. I do that too. I've had some lingam massages, but they weren't, <laughs> they weren't like that. Um, what? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. The, get out. Yeah, that's what I do as well. No, stop it. Blah, blah, blah. He's blushing. <laughs> get out. That's a whole nother podcast. Yeah. Talk about that's, lingam mass. Oh, my goodness. Um, that's a whole nother lingam. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but do the women ever feel, and I know there's people out there right now, going, shut up. I want to talk about this lingam massage. <laughs> another one. We'll do that another time. Um, do women ever feel... Because, yeah, okay, going, a man would feel funny if there was a man doing a lingam massage on a man. You know what I mean? You go, I've got okay. colleagues that do lingam massages on men. That would be but weird. But, yeah, like it is. There's, there's there's a, got a, there's, it's because of our, like, collective consciousness, our, like, wow. our, our that, what is seriously, it? Seriously, you've, you've blown my mind. Yeah, <laughs> there's men who really want to feel okay in their, like, you know, like their body is just, it's a body. You know, mm. and somebody touching their body doesn't mean anything about them. Mm. You know, it doesn't mean that they're gay or you know, and they can they can, they can feel safe. It can be feel, really actually change their understanding of what it actually to have a brother brother relationship that where there's respect and there's a commitment to keeping each other like safe and keeping each other like like holding each other. You know, like holding each other emotionally. And then you're gonna have a beer later on. Seriously, Dave, like this is a, a lot of my colleagues. Yeah, wow. a lot of my colleagues Get are out. amazing men who just really have gone there in terms of facing uncomfortability and homophobia and really crack through that that shame and that um, taboo around male to male intimacy. And not, I'm not talking about sexual intimacy. I'm mm. talking about emotional intim- intimacy and physical intimacy. Mm. You know, a, a man being able to hold another man physically like him naked and really being with him like it's it's really something that we've disconnected from in our society and you go back to tribal culture and it was really normal mm. it's really normal for a man to to grab his son and take him to like the woods and go son this is what we do with our bodies you know we we hunt with them we make love with them you know, be like really open and for them to be physical with each other, wrestle and for penises to come in contact with armpits and mm. heads and, you know, they just dealt with the body in such yeah, well. a different way. Well, even look at, um, I know I've been to, I've been to Bali too. I've been to Bali a few times <laughs> and all the boys obviously hold hands. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, and the first, the first time I went to Bali was, oh man, back in 19... Back in 1984 or 85, I went to Bali, and it yeah, was so it was like energy. literally a dirt road going through Ubud was just a wow. dirt road. It was so beautiful, but it was very unusual for me back then, being a boy of 15 or so, mm. and seeing boys hold hands. You know, I'm mm. seeing boys my age walking around holding hands. I'm just like, what? Yeah, the bro love is real in some countries, very like in hard Egypt. To, yeah. Like they cuddle and they kiss, like mm. they kiss on the cheek. Like yeah. they don't even. No, I got I got mates. That I actually got a very good one of my best mates is um, Egyptian. Yeah. Um, and we um, we see each other, we kiss each other, and chick, we cuddle each other. You know what I mean? Mm. Like it's it's what we do. And you how know? safe does it feel? Oh, yeah, it feels it feels very safe. I don't know if I could do it naked with him. That's a, that's that's you another. You don't know until you've tried. <laughs> I, sh- I should Mark, propose Mark, if you're this. listening to this, don't have any funny ideas. <laughs> Guy. <laughs> he's like what <laughs> but, yeah but it's um it's very but he's also got that relationship with his dad you know yeah, like right. that his relationship with his dad is and, and i had that relationship with his dad you know hey you oh, know and kiss beautiful. him but i never had that relationship with my dad yeah you know my my dad was sort of almost embarrassed to shake your hand you yeah. know like i remember you know going through my 20s and my dad shaking my hand and he would almost he, he wouldn't even look at me in the eye Wow. Like he'd shake my hand and go, yeah, hi, hi. It was like an embarrassment to shake my hand. Yep. And that's what uh, I'm talking about, Dave. Like mm. when you meet another man and you look them eye to eye mm. and you like you hold each other in that level of integrity, like you both know what this session is about. You know, this is about that man holding space for you inside of whatever process you need to go through and like just being held. Like take away the, take away the lingam thing, right? Just conceive. <laughs> Chop off the lingam. No, like... 
I don't want to talk, you know, like completely disregard sexuality in the mm. space. But what I'm trying to speak to is like a lot of people can like find it hard to conceive of how that might happen because mm. it's such a taboo oh, in society. Yeah. But if you just take away the sexuality for a minute and you just think about what men need to feel deeply seen and deeply trusted by another man and deeply trusting of another man, it makes a big difference in their life, you know, to like have another man hold them in their tears, hold them in their grief, hold them in their rage and for that to be okay like for another man to validate that and hold the strength mm. of that that space of like you're all right mate i got you you can do that do you think a lot of that comes from i mean i think we've all as men i know i do we've all got a desire to have your dad and have your dad you know give you a cuddle so i'm really big on making sure that with my boy i give him cuddles and he know and i tell him i love him yeah. you know and i kiss him on the cheek and yeah. you know and i tell him i'm proud of him and if he's upset, I make sure I hold him. I don't ever tell him, hey, you know, um, if he's emotional, I yeah. never tell him to stop crying or anything like that, you know. So um, and I think, I know I did, you know, and a lot of men from my generation growing up through the 70s and the 80s, um, we didn't get that emotional support from our fathers, you know. My father never held me. My father never gave me a cuddle, you know, and that's why he felt uncomfortable with me shaking my hand, you know. Yeah. And I, I remember, like my mate Mark, who we just told him about my Egyptian mate, um, I always was just so jealous. Not jealous is the wrong word. That's a that's like an envious joke. I'm not just, I just look at his relationship with his dad and how him and his dad would cuddle and, you know, and I just go, man, I just want that, you know. Totally. Is that, so is that why, you know, I think men are missing that love from their father absolutely mm. absolutely and it comes out in like really destructive ways sometimes mm. you know when that is there isn't that that safety and intimacy for men mm. where they can feel really like that there there's this safety of like i know that this man has my back mm. when they don't have that it can feel really really unsafe in the world mm. you know it can really feel like they haven't felt their own backbone mm. you know because that's how we develop that's how we develop we develop through our mentors basically demonstrating how it can look to be a man who stands strong inside of his integrity inside himself and inside of his own confidence inside of how he directs his energy his sexual energy his his purpose and his mission in life his relationships with his mates to look him straight in the eye, that means, mate, I got you. Mm. Like to divert your eye from a mate because you can't meet them and you can't have like a good handshake. Mm. That's real fear of intimacy right there. Mm. You know, that's that's going to hurt a man. Mm. That's going to hurt him in his heart. Like he's going to feel that. And I think that's a big part of why our men, you know, can feel really fumbly inside of their emotional relationships with women and they can feel like, like they need to like just be the provider and protector and and they can i think a lot of the time also feel really estranged from their sexuality as an emotional thing well i think as i said that that generation my generation the generations before us we grew up with that and i'm hoping that changes you know like i know you know i'm hoping there's more men that we're all trying to do our part to be a bit more open with our sons and 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 mothers be open with their daughters and and their sons and their sons yeah like all of us like just because we, I think, the men that are my age and, and, and maybe even a bit younger, a bit older, we didn't have that emotional support as much from family. That means that when it comes time to learn about the yoni and learn about intimacy with our partner, we didn't know shit. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're learning on the fly. As I yeah. said, we learnt from this and then your mates and your mate had an experience and you learn from that and then yeah. you're, you're making shit up because you want to sound good and yep. then you you get married or you get this and you're trying to you know do all this sort of stuff and yep. so i'm hoping that you know the generations that move forward yeah. can be a lot better equipped than what we ever were because we just didn't have the tools and yeah. you know um well that's what i'm here doing yeah you're yeah, you're, you're here this is what, what your gig is yeah it's, it's unreal it's about making sure that people have the deeply fulfilling intimacy and the, the safe space to mm. really explore what that is for them you know how do they create safety for themselves and and a sense of being connected to their to their to themselves you know and their and their pleasure and their and their intimacy mm. and I, I just like something you brought up was really important you said 
but let's talk about trauma for a minute. And we, we kind of touched on it when we were talking about the B- mm. BJJ. And I like, I just want to say like, with the mapping, it really allows people to feel safe enough to start having conversation with their body about what it's been through and what it does sometimes come up. You know, trauma does sometimes come up and trauma mm. is just emotions that are, you know, not integrated and some of them are big emotions, things that were really serious that happened to them that changed their life. Mm. And, you know, it doesn't always come up and it doesn't have to come up. Nothing has to come up. And we talked about confrontation as well and it's not it's not necessarily confronting any more than any... Pro- like a person guides the session. So they're really in control of how much they share, what comes up for them. It's really slow and paced and present. And so it's really important, like if somebody does have trauma and if this conversation is bringing stuff up for someone, that they really get in contact with mm. a practitioner. Yeah, yeah good call. Know? A practitioner, and if it's you know trauma that's affecting daily life, then to seek what what we call a somatic therapist, somatic experiencing therapist, a practitioner who is specialized in dealing with trauma. And I'm not specialized in dealing with trauma in that I'm not the prime I won't I would be part of a team that, you know, if you've got like a therapist and you've been working with therapists for a while and then you your therapist and you decide that it's time that you explore the sexual you know, the sexual aspect of it in, in a really body based way then you would come to me and have a session and but you would have the skills to be able to integrate your experience Mm. and feel confident that you've got your team around you to help you integrate the experience and and we'll pop up some information about um, yeah i'll put put some links in the notes um yeah and definitely that's a good call on the trauma you know because this may bring up some things for people um look i i had trauma as a kid a lot of sexual trauma even for men Let's, yeah, for men, oh, for men, for sure, you know, um, yeah. definitely if any men have got any trauma and this has brought that up and it, it, it's very likely it could have, um, I'll put some links in the, in the notes, um, we'll put links to your colleague that you, you yeah, chatted we'll, about. we'll put all the links that yeah. the, the psycho, psychosomatic yeah. um, therapists and, and Lily Isabella and for the parents who want to have chats with their children about this mm. stuff and men, if you, if you have you know, any troubles with like porn addictions, you know, because that's a real, really mm. a thing for us men and women at this, at this point in our mm. lives, you know, um, you know, I think most out. people are le- like, you think kids now are, are learning it yeah, from porn, you totally, know, totally, yeah, totally. That is really where a lot of our education is coming from. Mm. And porn addiction is a thing. Mm. It's, it's really damaging to, to relationships mm. and, and sexuality with oneself because yep. it programs the body to actually think that that's intimacy. And then when it doesn't marry up inside of what actually happens inside of real intimacy, the desire doesn't, the, the brain is conditioned mm. and patterned in terms of neurotransmitters and chemicals to only respond to that stimulus. Mm. So then when you're trying to actually have a real experience, your erection goes or you ha- you can't sustain it. It's not living up to what you saw. This part of it is yep. that it's not living up and part of it is that your brain, it's your brain is so powerful that it forms associations. Mm. And so the pleasure centers, it's like gambling, okay? You, you get a hit of good emotions or you get a, a hit of, sorry, not good emotions, good good chemicals that, that strengthens the association with that stimulus. Mm. So it associates, for example, sex with having a a ejaculation stimulated by this image mm. these images and then when you're having sex and you're actually trying to like connect with your partner or you're trying to connect with yourself in your self pleasure it just doesn't happen without that stimulus mm. that's what your body you've conditioned the body to do and it's so destructive it literally steals away you the deep beautiful sexuality that you can experience with yourself when you truly connect with yourself and you connect with your partner Mm. so it's leaving a lot of marriages and a lot of partnerships really and a lot of men really really at like wit's end with how do i deal with this and like not knowing how like what to do instead you know because it is Mm. a lot of the time at the mercy of of, you know what the what the pattern is yeah and so i just like encourage men and women you know the the porn addiction is not just there it's it's actually happening with women too Mm. and you know, at the bottom of it, we're all just trying to contact what intimacy is to us and how sexuality 
we, we want our sexuality to look and we just want to connect you know with that feeling and it's a really important feeling and it's so important to our physical well-being and our uh, emotional and mental well-being and like I just encourage anybody that's struggling with anything to do with their sexuality their emotional intimacy it's like to get in touch you know well, get in touch yeah get in touch with me no pun intended Oh, no pun intended. <laughs> slightly creepy. Um, <laughs> slightly creepy. <laughs> Took me a while, kind of in my head. <laughs> Thank you so much for having a chat. You are Thanks. beautiful. You're amazing. And I'll Thanks, stick all those you. links in the notes. And um, yeah, if anyone's got any things, they can contact you via yeah, that. Yeah. Totally. Mwah. Mwah. Thank beautiful. you. <laughs> This has been another episode of the Bold and the Beautiful podcast. Davella has left the building.